Hello, and welcome to the next episode of Lost in Criterion. I am your host, John Patrick Ordhari Dorgan, and I'm joined by my other host, my other host, our other host, the other host, the Adam Glass. I just had a mental uh, breakdown <laughs> while recording. It's okay, man. It's okay, man. I still love it that you introduce every episode you introduce as the next episode. Well, because it is the next episode. What? Well, you're you're welcoming them to this episode, Pat. No, 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 I mean, no. This welcome, is the next episode. They're welcome to the next. I know what I'm to talking the next about here. As well. I know what you're doing. I, I I I see where you're going with this, Patrick. And now that I do it every time, I kind of have to keep it going. <laughs> yeah, it's true. It's true. It's like uh, we our our friend Jonathan Hape, who who graciously does the music for us, uh, used to introduce every song. And after he, after he talks, because he's he's a musician, when he plays live, he'll. He'll finish every song introduction with "and I hope you enjoy it," uh, <laughs> right? Just in case, every single one. And then I, uh, and then he and I also have a band together, uh, where I am the lead singer, and I started to do that just to make fun of him, and it got him to stop. Don't make fun of him. I'm a jerk. Mm, that's true. Sometimes. Anyway, can you what hear do we got me? This okay. Week? I can hear you fine. Okay. I can hear you fine. My my microphone level just dropped all of a sudden. Yeah. Well, hopefully, uh, hopefully it doesn't drop in your recording. But I think we're okay if you can hear me. I can hear you fine. So let's uh, let's, let's move not on talk with about this. microphones anymore. Okay. Understood. Yeah. Yeah. All right. This week's episode is on uh, "Branded to Kill," uh, 1967 Japanese New Wave, oh. uh, directed by Seijun. Suzuki? Did I, um, did I say yeah, that okay? Yeah, close enough. <laughs> Seijun? Seijun Suzuki. You pronounce all of that? Seijun Seijun. Suzuki. Yeah, it's fine. Suzuki. That's, that's uh, No, that's yeah, you, you got his last name fine. And the, the first name was fine. You were just sort of halting, so it was kind of... Yeah. Seijun. Yeah, Seijun Suzuki. Well, I can say Suzuki. I've been, I've been hearing that word since right. the 80s. Oh, wait, no, that's Kawasaki Ninjas. <laughs> ah, the little black like power wheels. Those were... They did a lot of great things mm. in the 80s. Um, anyway, so this movie, Branded to Kill. Uh, Suzuki, um, quick quick background information, kind of a B-movie guy, um, which, you know, I, I don't know. We, we taught when we did, uh, way back when we did Seven Samurai, we talked about how Kurosawa is seen as more of a Western movie director. Um... Would this be more more what we think of when we think of Japanese cinema? This, I don't... not necessarily. This man is a, from what I've seen, the two movies of his I've seen, he is yeah. so hardcore Japanese crime movie. Yeah. Ish that that's it almost it, That's hurts. what it seemed to me. Like, I don't that's know if I would call me. that Japanese, I mean, it's like saying American cinema. Like, it's a nonsense term, well, yeah. right? Like, I, I mean, mean, like, I mean, it's... Obviously, 1940s noir is not American cinema. In its entirety, right. So, I I, I don't. This is think, a very specific genre of film. I don't right. honestly think that the people who criticize Kurosawa are really being fair, uh, yeah. because it seems more like racism than it does actual film critique. Well, yeah. I uh, mean, there's always there's always that, but but at the same time, you know, the the selling out of your own culture. Right, but I yeah, <laughs> like I don't know. Gets, that, be, yeah. gets people a little in a huff. Well, but I don't know, I don't know whether or not he's that. doing that or not. This one is. Yeah. Branded to Kill less so than our next film. Um, yeah. Because the next one feels 100% like just a yeah, a, a, sort of a Japanese-style mob movie, okay? Where yeah. our main character is a bad guy, basically. Um, but this one, Branded to Kill, is weird. I wouldn't necessarily call it... It's certainly not Americanized. I might call it fran- franchised? <laughs> it has some weird... Maybe Germanized, some weird nihilism yeah. and stuff in it that yeah, make it yeah. not what necessarily I would think of as Japanese like yeah. culture. Well, but at the same time, I don't know enough about Japanese sixties culture because everything I've seen in Japanese <laughs> sixty movies, man, those people were weird. <laughs> Everybody was weird. In I mean, the 60s. like I, I, I kind of wish I lived there. I do actually want to want to talk a little bit more about that, but but. Just suffice it to say about this movie before we before we really get into the things. Uh, to quote, I, I think I pulled this off of Wikipedia, but it was also on the IMDb page, so somebody was already 
already uh, somebody's already uh, stolen from somebody else. Yeah, someone's someone's already plagiarizing. Uh, when Suzuki delivered this uh, this film to the executives at a studio, he was promptly fired. Yes, <laughs> and they said that he made films that it, don't that make no sense and yeah, no money. They called it they called it incomprehensible. Yeah, <laughs> and and said it made no money. Um, yeah. Um, I can't say that I disagree with them. <laughs> exactly. The movie it is, is, it is pretty incomprehensible. It is a little. I mean, it's not the most incomprehensible film we've watched by any means. Okay. No. Oh no. And it will not be the most. Well, and really... it will not be the most incomprehensible film we've ever watched because I know some of the ones that are coming up. Um, I'm looking at you, Brazil. Um, <laughs> but like, um, it's weird. Like I said, it the narrative stays together. Okay. It's a little yeah. hard to follow at points where I'm like, why did that happen? She's locked in the shower. When did that happen? <laughs> so if you, there's, there are some moments like that. Why are there all these butterflies? Um, things like that. His, his wife was weird. The Mitch, the Mitch I actually was liked his wife. I, I enjoyed his really? wife's character actually a lot. And not just because apparently she was some sort of weird sex fiend. Um, <laughs> her character was just quirky enough that I liked her. She was about the only yeah. character in the movie that I actually liked. A few things. A few things that affected this movie, uh, according to uh, according to one of the Criterion uh, Criterion essays, he didn't like to use storyboards or or pre plan anything. Yeah, it seems like he just um, cooked it up that night, the night before he made it. But at the same time, from what I've read, the uh, this was his fortieth movie. He produced B movies for the studio. Boom, 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 because that was their B movie schedule. They had like five days of pre production. Yeah, but I think that's pretty part of the course. For and then movies. twenty, yeah, twenty five days to film, and then like two days to edit. Mm-hmm. And he did all of his editing in one day anyway, according to him, because he was taught not to waste film when you were recording, only shoot the shots that you're going to use. That explains um, so much about the things I watched. <laughs> yeah, because yeah. there's he, madness uh, in there. There are things that should have been cut. Yeah. No, no, there are there are definitely shots I wouldn't have used, but, but it happens. But yeah, this is this is the story of the number three, uh, the number <laughs> the, three killer the, the in third Japan. ranked killer in Japan. <laughs> um, oh, I'm not quite madness. sure. I'm Everybody not quite sure madness. what organization does the rankings. I don't know. Like the number three killer it's in madness. Japan. It's like I feel like there's some sort of now there's some sort of like whole Japan body, like, governing body. It's like, oh, well, <laughs> looks like you're number two now. How does is it there, feel? Uh, I'm going to have to investigate. Is there an equivalent to the Freedom of Information Act in Japan? I'm going to have to look into it. Yeah. Right to someone. And be like, like is there an internationally governing body that is possibly <laughs> in the 60s ranked killers uh, based on, I don't know, weirdness? Yeah, yeah, number three. Well, number one's not so weird. He's just really standoffish. Um, he's weird. Yes. Because he has the least effective killing technique ever. <laughs> Certainly the one that leaves the most evidence possible. It's true. There are tape um, recorders. There, he's in like four different buildings while he's waiting for him. The man is like a is like a evidence making machine. Yeah. Yeah. He like Number stays one. with him all day. <laughs> it's like no, no, the police are gonna have no they trouble share a finding bed. him. He doesn't no, they don't just, they don't just, he, he moves in. Yeah, he, it's like, if this is his standard operating technique, he's the I worst killer not. ever. I have to assume, I have to assume. We don't assume know anything about number not... two. I think number two was on fire, right? Number two seemed to be the least quirky of the ball. Because. And then got, but, but wasn't number two the guy who got killed by being run over by the car? No, he's the one on fire, I thought. Oh, okay. Same scene. I can't remember. I think the guy who got run over was his associate. 
<laughs> Which would make him what number, number eleven or something? Or... <laughs> I don't know. Who knows? If everybody in Japan is ranked, so that based on that information, <laughs> I'm on the list somewhere. I am is not it, a is killer. It ranching but... or is it? I is, assume it, is it actually two or, that it actually included or is it like a tree thing. I assumed it included every single person in the country. <laughs> well, probably when you're born, you're you assigned. Are, you your are number. way. You are way down that. Oh list, man. yeah, I am the worst murderer ever. I I I, I, I spent. Mean, three hours trying to kill a spider with a frying pan. <laughs> that probably got me into negative numbers if it's possible. Probably, probably. You're, oh, I don't know. Has negative, it's negative one better than number one? <laughs> no, that, um, I don't know what that... Uh, you're really good at saving lives? Um, yeah. Okay, so totally irrelevant to the, to the movie, sorry. Um, this where film we? in particular, this film in particular is said to have influenced John Woo, Tarantino... Jim Jarmusch. Uh, Jim Jarmusch actually uh, I don't... has called this his favorite hitman film, and he borrowed a scene from this movie, if I'm if I'm remembering correctly. I can uh, s- Ghost Dog. Oh, go ahead. Sorry. Ghost Dog had a scene where where someone was killed by shooting up through uh, a, a sink drain. If I'm I'm pretty sure. I um, yeah. I can see so why people sense. like it. I do. Yeah. I just I didn't. can see why people like it, but I still think that Quentin Tarantino likes it because it's hey a Japanese movie that's I feel kind of like, cool, I, but you've ne- you've never heard. I of feel it. like that's why most people like it. <laughs> yeah, because if you're asked no, to like, name clearly... a film you really like, if you're one of those guys, you yeah. have to pick one that no one's ever seen before. Yeah. Like, with with Tarantino's Tarantino's more interested like like Tarantino movies have have devolved into not even being about reality but being just a a loose conscription not not loose a very tight conscription of uh, movie homages yeah it is it's and, just and, a, a nonstop series borrowed, of them yeah yeah borrowed things and and you know that's that's why in his last couple movies you know, Django Unchained and then uh, and then the World War Two one and Glorious Bastards. They're not. They're not concerned with actual history, but they are concerned with how that those points in history have been portrayed in film. Right. When I actually um, liked *Inglorious Bastards*, I enjoyed that yeah. film. Like, I think like it's well, better than some of the other homages. Like, yeah. I thought, um, what was it? Um, the one about the car. Death proof. Yeah, was god awful. Was that, was that his? Yeah. yeah the, the the grindhouse. Just was. was just. Ugh. Just ugh. yeah, I never saw that either. Um, I'm not a huge fan of Tarantino. I will admit, I'm, and, I'm and not my, my... either. I have enjoyed some of the films. Yeah, I have enjoyed. Some like of I said, films. I did but enjoy anyway, *Glorious Bastards* because I, I, I like those kind of war films. Those like no real yeah. history included war films. Yeah, yeah, and they get they get made a lot. So I'm not I'm not I'm not necessarily yeah. I'm not trying to. Oh okay, yeah, yeah. Let's let's countries. move on. But yeah, I. I, I, I mention it to say that this is this is the sort of movie I, I imagine. He, he loves it. <laughs> well, here's the thing. Is I feel like maybe we're suffering from a time gap problem again. There have been some movies maybe. that we liked that were made at a vastly different period of time that we really enjoyed. But there's some yeah. of them I feel like people in... I feel like we're getting into one of those situations where you had to be there. Yeah. You had to watch this with the right Maybe. state of mind, at the right time, and you would think it was the coolest thing you'd ever seen. Well, I think you had to be think... you had to be twenty years old, a little high in college. <laughs> I think you might be right because this movie, this movie in particular, is is very much a a purposeful breaking from a set you know, semi tradition. You know, oh well, he's, yeah, he's most tired. certainly, yeah. Suzuki's like tired of doing his B movies. He thinks he well, ought to be, and he's the tired A's, of doing. So he's these, um, yeah. especially doing these like these mob the films, Yakuza yeah, the Yakuza yeah. films. They're they have yeah. such a standard storyline, like yeah. that, even now that are still pretty followed. Like they're not broken from substantially because the people yeah. who watch them want to watch this certain thing happen. There are, yeah. yeah, I mean, we experience that so, in American cinema too. It's there's a certain type yeah, of film. Yeah, so he's purposely trying to break from right. It. And, and you got into it. You got into it a little bit earlier, and you, you're you're hitting it at something I wanted to get at, but then I decided that I wanted to pause so we could put in the theme song. Sorry. Um, 
that uh, that this feels a little more French or maybe German, but I think it just feels a little more postmodern. I think, I, and not even necessarily postmodern. I think I think it feels almost Dada, um, <laughs> because it's just it's kind of unconcerned with with what it's doing. It's not being weird for weird sake. It's being weird because it's fun, and why why. Uh, why tie yourself to the traditions that mean nothing? <laughs> uh, right. Well, there's actually a really, like, because on the Wikipedia article, they talk about how it's become kind of like, kind of an uh, absurdist masterpiece. Yeah. But I, yeah, it doesn't it, really it's, say it's whether really... or not he did it on purpose to be absurdist. Where if that's just think, the story he ended up yeah. telling. Yeah. I don't is think, absurdist. you know, obviously he, he fought in World War Two, but not very well. He kind of, his background information suggests that he just kind of ended up as a movie director because there wasn't really anything else to do. Uh, from what I've read, he like walked into the to the uh, production company while they were giving a some sort of test uh, for <laughs> for placement within their organization and became an assistant director because he passed the test. <laughs> Sounds about so, right for Japan, yeah. <clears throat> yeah. So, you know, it's not, he in, in, he was in the Navy during World War II, but he was a meteorologist who ended up getting shipwrecked twice. Um, <laughs> so it's just, you know, he's kind of floating, but he still has that, that post-World War II, I saw war and, and everything's meaningless. You can get a feel from that. Yeah, for sure. But at the same time, I'm not sure, I'm not sure that he really got He's really doing it on purpose. Yeah, I don't. Like, I don't think he is. Just because, not, like, it doesn't have that deliberate feel to it. It doesn't have yeah, that like I don't, overwrought. I don't say, like, I'm doing it's this. It's not overwrought. That's certainly true. I don't. I don't want to say that. I don't think he's doing it. That he's a mind to do it, but I don't think he's purposefully trying to. <clears throat> he's not trying to deconstruct necessarily. Right. Well, what I'm saying is, I don't think film. he sat down and said. He's I'm going to make tired. an absurdist yeah. version of a Yakuza film. Yeah. I think he's just tired of making the Yakuza film. Yeah, Yakuza exactly. Film. He's like, you know what, this one, <clears throat> screw it. I'm not going to do it. I'm going to yeah. go crazy. Yeah. And and <clears throat> this movie has a... I, I don't necessarily know the conventions of the movie, uh, of the films. Watching, do not, watching our next do movie, not Tokyo mad, Drifter... Yeah. It gives you pretty much a good idea. I, I think gets, it's gets, not, a, gets a better idea. It's not far off of what you expect from American mob films. Yeah. There's yeah, not yeah, a lot yeah. of difference. We have an anti-hero who yeah. in some way is redeeming himself but is still obviously an anti-hero. You know what I mean? Like yeah. he never – he grows but we don't typically end the film with him like on the good team. He's still yeah. a mobster. He's just the best mobster – Yes. In a certain mile a radius, one. yeah. Yeah. He's a, I do like, and they I do always like have some sort of quirk, scene. some rule about who they yeah. will or will not kill, things like that. Yeah. Yeah, which obviously obviously John Woo gets a lot of influence on his Oh, on his like John movies. Woo. I mean, Tw- Tarantino I can see as like him saying, oh, he's one of my influences. But I don't see it a yeah. lot in his films as much as I would yeah. in a John Woo film. John Woo reeks of this guy. If 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 he did take his influence from him, it's obvious. Yeah, and yeah. I don't think it's a bad thing because I think John Woo films benefit from using him as an influence. Yeah. I mean, for the most part, you get like well, because like I don't mind as we talked about before. I mean, there are certain elements of John Woo films that drive me absolutely crazy, but adding a little bit of depth to the characters to make them a little bit more mindful of what yeah. they're doing. Rather than just being ruthless killers is a nice thing to do. And and yeah. we do see that with crazy rice smelling guy. Hanada yes. is yes. is he, But he, he he's weirdly not concerned it's uh, it's weird. <laughs> That's all I'm gonna get into, is this is just a weird movie in a lot of ways. Like he is not at all a good guy. No. And he doesn't no. redeem himself he's... in any way. He doesn't do yeah. anything that and makes he, him a better person. He's also in no way irredeemably bad. He's not like he's not outright evil, but no. he's not. He's just concerned with being number one. He's ineffectual at being number one, but he's just concerned with being number one. Yeah, and he has weird cheeks. And he has he has weird cheeks, which I have to assume were some sort of implant. Uh, yeah, because I, well, because they there was an interview with the guy afterwards on 
Hulu, and uh, yeah, it it he right. he looks like a normal guy for the most part. Yeah, he is a normal guy. I didn't see that. Um, yeah. <laughs> Uh, there's so much weird about this. There's movie a movie, lot of weird stuff. It's not. I don't like, think it's the bad. The scene where they're on like where they're on like the escort mission, and the other guy starts freaking out and it, just starts to like dance and foam at the mouth while they're being shot at, huh? And foam at the mouth, yes. and then foam at the mouth. Yeah, it's he goes weird. completely insane. Yeah, um, <laughs> it is weird. It is weird. Like, I won't even know why he's foaming at the mouth, and then like he's drunk and. Here's what I will say. Yeah. I enjoyed the second half of the movie better than I enjoyed the first half of the movie. Okay. And where where would you mark that? I half do not know. Breaking. But at some point I didn't hate it as much as I did. Okay. Because when it gets really into well. the part where he's being hunted by the other guy, I suddenly felt yeah. like we had structure. It was a yeah. it was a there it was, was madness, there was... but there was something was happening. The first there half, was more plot structure right. because it's not necessarily that suddenly something was happening, because this movie this movie isn't completely unconcerned with its own continuity. No, no, um, but it it felt <laughs> like the structure became nailed down. Like but, at that point, I knew how it was yeah. going to go. I knew that the, yeah. this guy's trying to kill him. He doesn't want to be killed. We will now watch him try to avoid being killed. Yeah, again, rather ineffectually, but nonetheless, doing that thing that seems normal. For a person to do, the yeah. first half of the There's film a, seems more like a feels like it wanders a little bit more. Like, like we spend about five minutes of rice fueled sex, <laughs> which has really we no more, place in we the spend story. More than five minutes. I ever. drifted in. <coughs> it was a, we 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 spend a good half hour. Do I we? I I, I sort of yet. lost track of it, but like. I spent most of the time hoping my wife didn't come down the stairs. Because um, I was, like, watching I'm like, how are you going to explain this? Uh, but, like... Yeah, no. Yeah, you see A lot saying. of this movie is essentially softcore porn. Yeah, and it's... Well, but that's, again... That's this kind of movie. Um, yeah. But, and I don't have oh, a problem exactly. with that. I just have a problem with the fact that, like, during that time, I don't know why anything that's happening is happening. Yeah, you know what I mean. But when we get to the, the point jumps. where he's got to be killed because he screws up, I feel like that's when the film yeah. starts. I think I think there's a moment later in the movie where where the quick jump cuts start to feel more like they're in his head, or, yeah. or what we're jumping to isn't necessarily reality. Whereas in the early part of the movie, it. it it still feels like everything we're seeing is supposed to be real, and then it's just disjointed. Well, yeah, I mean, and later on in the movie, it's his own paranoia get, like, fueling it. Yeah, like later, and on. it might be his own pure, 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 pure paranoia filming everything. But like, like in the movie after the little escort thing, mm -hmm. uh, they kill the last two guys, and then his car breaks down, and he gets in the car with with the woman who would eventually be the mistress, and they have a little chat. But then he's immediately back with his wife. Yeah, scene. but I think that actually happened. I think we just yeah, have I'm, a I'm, really I'm sure bad. It I think our director did not do a great job of telling us the passage of time. Yeah, and I and I think that might actually be purposeful. I think I think he's he's trying to mess with things to that extent, or at least not caring enough to make sure that we know how much time has passed between yeah. things happening. Yeah, because from yeah. what you can tell from the way the film was shot, it could have happened in, like, a day? Two days? Yeah. It's obviously yeah. more, because I'm pretty sure that that the, the rice-fueled sex scene is, like, four days. <laughs> it seems like it. There's an awful lot it of lounging like around that goes on. Um, I feel like it's... I think this is mo the most 60s movie we've ever watched. It probably is. Like... We've seen some other ones that have some... Like, uh, what was the one about the... Um, I don't even know what era it was made in. The one about the... the It was French. Um, and the computer. <laughs> What's the name of that? Oh, uh, Alphaville. When this, was that made? No, this, <clears throat> that was... I can't remember. Well, I feel like that that's the... got that kind of weird... 
Not Goddard. No, that's psychedelic. I mean, that's exactly, but this is the most you know, '60s film we have watched. I feel yeah. like when you when you called it, it was '65. When you called this movie French, I assume what you're meaning was that it feels like French New Wave. Yes, it does, and it's it's absurdism like French New Wave. So this movie this movie does for for the Japanese mobster film what Alphaville does for sci-fi. It just it makes it weird and incomprehensible. It, it takes it takes the conventions and then makes them weird and incomprehensible. <laughs> I'm glad we're in um, we're in agreement about that part at least. No, I just. Oh no, it's absolutely. I, it's just like, but, but like I said, the, I still like the second half better because yeah. there are weird elements. I do not like the weird like he's drunk and I think that happens in the second half. Like there's birds and stuff. I don't. <laughs> that was weird and I didn't understand it. Yeah, her her apartment is like decorated in dead butterflies and birds. Yeah, which is and crazy. Then, and then he leaves and comes back and they're all gone. <laughs> it's all very weird and like. But yeah. like I feel like that's that when we he starts being hunted is when we pick up structure, like yeah. a real yeah. honest to god. Mo- and like I said, I really feel like that's where the film starts. However many minutes that is into the film is where we suddenly start the movie. Everything else yeah. is basically just a preamble explaining that he. It's basically just does feels like a different movie almost to me. Well, I think I think one of the one of the things there is that. When we get to that point, we know him well enough. Where uh, when we start the movie, there's really no exposition. Yeah, that's just, true. We just start with him we're in on it. the job. Yeah, we're in it, and we know that he's a hitman because he's killing people. Uh, like the opening sequence of the movie is is basically a black screen, and at least two deaths happen in that black screen, and then a plane lands. And what does that mean? <laughs> what is that? Right. That's nothing. Yeah. That's. Yeah, that's not exposition. That's just the start. Um, time is passing, yes, but plot isn't. Um, yeah, and I and I feel like a... most of the beginning is time passing without story happening. Like I know yeah. we're escorting the guy that is actually the number one, but Which, we don't yeah, know it. There. But like that doesn't feel like it means anything. To me, it doesn't. It doesn't. It really. It, doesn't. it really no, doesn't. That's... Until we get to the point where he kills, makes a mistake killing the foreigner. I don't feel like we're telling a story. And then suddenly we're telling a story. The number two is hunted no, by think, everybody I else, think you're right. and then he becomes the number one in the most inept way possible. Yeah. No, I think you're right, and I think that one of the reasons this movie is hailed bec- is because it doesn't tell a story, <clears throat> really. But but we actually do reach a point where we start to tell a story. Oh yeah, most certainly. I feel it. like at that point we start yeah. telling a story. There is yeah. definitely a story in there, and and that's like yeah, I said, and that's where I start to out, like it. That's when I started to be like, and oh, it's at that okay. point. It's at that point that we find out why he killed the last three guys, and yeah, exactly. And it's at that point where I feel like. Suddenly, I was involved again. Yeah. Like, up until that yeah. point, I was just kind of bored. Mostly waiting for the next picture of nipples. But then, <laughs> suddenly that ended, and we were telling a story again. Yeah. Which, by the way, his mistress is substantially uglier than his wife. I'll go with it. No, I just, yeah. I, I, I'm, hey, when I've got nothing to watch other than looking at the people's faces, that's what happens. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, I, the only ones <coughs> I make comments like that on are the ones where I'm bored out of my mind. <laughs> and that first half that of the film, super, I was really bored. I really was. I, I was, was super like, bored oh. by the first half. I was, I was, I was trying to pay attention because we have to do a podcast about it. Well, one, I have to do a podcast <laughs> about it, but but even even then, I, I stopped paying. It. Like I can't, I can't remember how this movie ended. <laughs> oh, I remember how this ended because that's the only part that really, like, I was like, wow, well. Let's be honest. I remember the last important scene. I think there was some stuff that happened afterwards. Yeah, I'm sure. I'm sure. I remember the shootout uh, at the gymnasium. At the yeah, at the gymnasium. I do not remember if something else happens after that. Because that's when the plot resolved. Yeah. After that, anything that happens is irrelevant. as much as there was plot. Well, like I said, like when he's being hunted. We go through yeah. a very basic, not very well thought out plot, but it is a plot. I mean, it's a man 
trying to escape from his killer. His killer's tormenting him. He triumphs over the killer. And yeah, yeah, kill ah kills his girlfriend. And that's the end of it. Yes. And like yeah. that's a that's a and, that's a story. I mean, that is a story. It's it could have been better told by me and by him. <laughs> but um, it yeah. is a story. But no one no one was interested in telling the story better though. It was a B movie to start with, right? So, which is why he know. got fired. Yeah, because everybody looked at yeah. this and said, "Why did you do this?" And I yeah. understand. Like I said, I agree with the studio. He actually sued the studio, by the way, and won uh, four years later. Because not only not only did they fire him, but they also kind of tried to blame him for the uh, decline of the studio period. Well, that's not fair. <laughs> um, so he sued, and the studio had actually closed and reinvented itself uh, as a softcore porn uh, by, by the mid-70s. I can see that. And this came out in 67, so... But it was, I, I, I guess it was the, uh, the oldest, uh, the oldest movie production company in Japan mm. when he, when he was working there. Interesting. Um, and then it, and then it started making softcore porn five years Not later. Not terribly surprising. Which I mean, yeah, it's Japan. I assume most movies are softcore porn. Yeah, maybe. I'm not sure. That's my under, that's my understanding. I think almost everything in Japan is possibly, possibly softcore porn. Let's just go with that. You would know. Walking down the street. Oh, sorry. <clears throat> yeah. I mean, as long as the genitalia are pixelated, um, they can do anything, right? Exactly. Um, yeah, so, which all genitalia... A strange country. All genitalia are pixelated. Yes. Not just, not just in movies. Not just, yeah, exactly, in real life. Well, softcore or hardcore, <laughs> it's pixelated. Yeah, yeah. But yeah, this is uh, <laughs> yeah, yeah. No, we've gotten this. We're we've gotten totally off topic now. But... No, because there's not. I don't have a lot more to say about the film, unfortunately. Yeah, there's like not... there's not. It didn't really get me going. Like there was not anything for me to sink my teeth into. Yeah. I everybody's everybody's weird in this movie. Um, yeah, there's no normal people. His, his wife is obsessed with furs and sex. Um, right. One and like I said, she's my favorite character. Uh-huh. Not just because she's oh, she's, she's the most naked, but because I she's I've, ridiculous. She's ridiculous, she's ridiculous but ridiculous I like her ridiculousness. Yeah, yeah. Um, he's he's obsessed with sniffing uh, <laughs> rice, sniffing which is weird, freshly steamed which rice. Which weirdly enough is a quirk that I liked. I th- I found that quirk interesting, yeah. but unfortunately, like I don't feel like it's it's a weird. It's a very weird way to humanize him. But, but I like it. it. I do like it. Him. I just don't like the fact that like it doesn't. It seems to only come to the forefront to get him aroused, and nothing yeah. else. You know what I mean? Yeah. Well, there is that moment very, very early at the bar, very close to the beginning at the bar. Yeah, where he's not necessarily doing it to get aroused, right? But, and and but I wish we had, but had at some the same more time. Scene. His wife is flirting with someone else. I wish so. we had had some more scenes where he's doing it yeah. just because he really likes it, and not because yeah, and not because it turns him on. Yeah. As just a, a weird human element. Very clearly, later in the movie, it, it it's his aphrodisiac. It effectively, yeah. effectively Viagra for him. Yes, which is um, really weird. But again, like yeah. it's a weird quirk that I kind of like. In yeah. that, like it, yeah. it's so crazily human that it's gone beyond the scope of humanity. Um, I am. I am. Yeah, I'm not. I'm not. I'm not trying to down it for that. I I love that because it's absurd. Yeah, it's exactly. Absurd. That's what I'm saying. Is it's I, that's yeah. why I like it too. Um, I just wish the other characters had had some of that kind of stuff going on, like the the I don't even know her name. Um, Masako, the I think. Mistress? Yeah, the mistress Masako. The wife. Oh, the wife. No, uh, yeah, the mistress. The mistress, yeah. the mistress is I think Masako. I have to go look. Yeah. Um, is horrible i wish she were dead i'm sure she is because well so do, so does she she wishes she i know dead. that's her own defining characteristic is her but is that's her, her own. only characteristic and it makes me so upset yeah. i feel you know what i feel like when i'm watching her you remember the germans the nihilists and big lebowski she yes. is them but they are played for laughs she is played for serious yes. and that makes yes. her terrible 
It's like people who read what nihilism was and decided that sounds cool. Exactly. So, exactly. So. Like, it really, her character bothers me so much. Yeah. Yeah. Hanging dead birds from her mirror. It was... Yeah. 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 Everybody's got their one defining quirk. Okay, yeah. defining quirk is that she uh, Misako. Not. Sorry, Misako, not Masako. Yeah. Yeah, and but, like, hers is the least human. To the point of just making me angry. I think there's a certain subset where uh, subset of people where that is that is a very human thing. To just, oh, I know, to but not like it's just, to just something. Rather be dead. But. No, yeah, I know, but like, but she's not like suicidal. She's not actively trying. No, to, but she just made to... me so angry. <laughs> I don't yeah. know how to explain it. Like, I don't have a really solid reason except for she just made me terribly angry. Every time she was on on screen, I was like, please get her off. Please make her go away. I like one one thing I really like in this movie is that for a while we suggest that number one might be just a rumor. Yeah. And how do you have how do you have the ranking if no one's sure that number one actually exists? I don't know. <laughs> the ranking is madness. Oh, somebody's been killing all these important people. It must be number one. But I mean, number ones are myth. Sometimes sometimes I'll tell people that that. that X is my number three favorite thing, and they'll ask what my actual favorite thing in the category is. And I say, oh, no, I don't have one. I just want to keep that space open. Yeah. So maybe that's what we're doing. Here. Right. They're like, oh, nobody's really hit number one yet. We just, we don't, we don't want to. We yeah, wanna, we don't want to give it away uh, too prematurely. soon. Prematurely. Yeah. We don't want to prematurely claim someone's number one. Uh, so we're just going to have everyone be number two through six. Uh, yeah, I wonder how far that ranking actually goes. Oh, I think you're probably right. Whole, whole country. country. I'm number one million four hundred and fifty-five. There you go. <laughs> and if I accidentally hit somebody higher up with a car, I get bumped up. Um. <laughs> I, I, yeah, is it individually ranked, or do you, or by killing number one, do you automatically become number one? I think one? so. Do you like? Do you like get all of their kills added <laughs> yeah, to yours? I think so. I think it's it's a, that's why it like that's why if you're really like unfortunately lucky, you could get into a car accident yeah. where you become number one. Yeah, and then everyone starts trying to kill exactly you for no terrible. reason. <laughs> like I just can we, can I just got into a car Let's make that movie, Pat. Let's make that movie. Yes, later. I love someone, that. Movie. Someone just accidentally kills the number one. So yeah, I'm, there's got to be a great movie idea. like that. I used to joke that that's how that's how they decided on a new pope, whoever killed the old pope. <laughs> Even if it's an accident. Yeah. Oh no, the old pope slipped in the bathtub while I was uh, <laughs> I was oh, washing. I guess little... his butler is his. Yeah, right. Exactly. Whoever installed that bathtub, find that man. <laughs> uh, no, man. I. Uh, there's just not a lot to say. I, I, there I do understand. There's not, there's not a whole lot going. On. I do understand in some base level why people liked it. Yeah. Simultaneously, uh, I do not like it. And I do not think I understand that anybody should like it. And we've been talking about, we've been talking about plot pretty much and and characterization, but cinematography wise, there's a lot going on um, with, with the way it's edited and, and the angles they get shots from and, and the framing of the shots is very, it feels like it feels like theater in a lot of the framing. Um, you know, I really, I wasn't paying very much very, attention to it. They're very. Well, I, I I really feel that um, the, his other movie that we watched uh, that we'll be talking about on the next episode, Tokyo Drifter. This is definitely more true for so, <clears throat> but but the the oh, you mean kind of like the walking I, in off stage. Thing yeah. that they do, yeah. yeah, that's something that's in both movies for sure. There's this yeah. weird, like, I feel, I feel like interstage there's a lot of staging. left, yeah. Yeah, there's a lot of staging in this to make it feel more like filmed theater than than an actual movie. Which is something um, we saw in the Akira Kurosawa films, too. And I don't know yeah, if it's... Well, that's, that's something it's that was style, very true yeah. for cinema. That was, uh, I think, I think... Oh, I did read this somewhere that that the Japanese really embraced cinescope because the dimensions were the same as traditional Japanese theater. I can the, see that, like stage area, um, or or at least very close to a very wide, 
but short. Yeah, not very tall, yeah. Vertically short. I can um, see that. Stage. So, so yeah, I think, and there's that, and that's, that's, that's interesting if you notice it. Um, there's a lot of great, there's a lot of great shots, a lot of great angles. I really like the scenes in the middle where he's killing those three people. They're all cleverly done. Which, um, wait. Oh, where yeah, he, I like shoots, the kill. Where yeah, he shoots the, kill the Dennis scene. up through I the... could have had that as the movie, too. It yeah. could have been where him as the guy really the, clever hit Through the animated billboard. Yes. I, I like the I like the drain pipe because it's the least effective method possible. The the yeah, chances that yeah. that guy would be looking over the pipe and leaning all the way down are yeah. so low that it's the most useless method of killing possible. I think. Yeah. What was the third guy? There's the lighter, oh, the pipe, and was there another one? No. I thought there was only. No, I can't remember. I swear there was a third, third murder. Oh, the the, the diamond dude where he didn't actually kill the guy. Yeah. Which is weird. I, think I don't right. know what happened there. Like, I remember watching the diamond merchant scene and being confused. Because he shoots up all the people in the lobby. And I thought yeah. the diamond merchant was the guy coming out of the room upstairs. But he doesn't shoot the diamond merchant, just jumps onto a balloon and floats away. <laughs> Which is absurd by itself. Yes. Yeah. Because I don't know how much those balloons oh. can hold, but really, what was his plan? But I don't know. Like, but it feels. It, I remember watching and going, "Wait, he didn't kill the guy he's supposed to kill." But maybe I'm wrong. Yeah. <laughs> what are you? What are you reading? Oh, just just remembering that he escapes on the balloon. Yeah, it's just, absurd. We watch him rise yeah. up in the background. Yes, it's probably yes. one of my favorite scenes in the movie. Even though it happens at a yeah. time where I was not really enjoying the film, when I saw that, I laughed. I was like, what? Wait, what? Because he, he's just yeah. laying on top, floating away. Yeah. Yeah. No, it's, it's definitely... Uh, there's a lot. There's a lot of crazy in this movie, yeah. and I love it. And I think I think there's a lot that it's one of those things where you, the more the more you get into it, and the more you want it to be saying something, it could say something. But I don't think Suzuki was actually meaning to say it. Right, and I, I think he was just having he was having fun, not necessarily for the sake of having fun, maybe for the sake of not, blowing off steam. Yeah, not doing what he always does. Not doing what he always does, just doing something different, doing something different, not only from what he <clears throat> was constantly told to do, but from what everyone was, uh, you know, he was purposely breaking convention just to break convention, yeah. not necessarily to, to do anything with breaking convention. Um, yeah, I would agree But he made that. a really fun movie. Uh, it, it, and it, if it had been a little bit more cleverly edited, yeah, it could be a lot more fun. It could. Yeah. It's a. It's a movie that could have had the potential to be even more interesting if it were done a little bit better, and yeah. I think that's where we get into why you see a lot of a lot of directors yeah. talking about it. There are so many wonderful scenes placed in a movie that's not that great. That if you're that yeah. kind of person who starts like at some young age. Probably, like I said, high in a college dormitory. <laughs> yeah. When you're 20 years old and you're thinking, I want to be a filmmaker, and you watch this film and you go, oh my God, there's so many cool scenes in this. And then your mind starts working with it and saying, how could I do something like that in, in what I want to do? Does that make sense? Yeah. But if you're yeah, not it's understandably influential, because yes, of something like that. because the scenes there's things like him rising on a balloon in the background while the jeweler's freaking out. It's an amazing scene in a part of the movie that's not that great. Yeah. And so I, that's just I I think that's where we get a lot of like people talk about it because yeah, yeah if you've got that kind of mind that's going ugh I want to make a movie and you see scenes this in your is... head anyway. You start thinking, oh man, I want a dude rising on a balloon in the background. I want a man shooting I up th- a pipe. I, th- yeah. 
Yeah, Suzuki is by no means a great director. He's, you know, he's doing weird stuff, but he doesn't, and, and you know, some of the shots he gets are great, but I think they're, they might even be accidentally great. He's not, yeah. From, yeah. I don't think he has any idea, in fact, I know he doesn't, because I read an interview in which he says he doesn't believe it, that film has a grammar. You get the shot you want to get. You don't, you don't worry about uh, whether or not the person talking in one cut appears to be eh, appears to be facing the person who he's talking to. You know, you're not right. concerned if Which two is people are facing the totally same direction when they're together. Feel when you're watching his movie, <laughs> yeah, it's like, oh, yeah. who's that Which person is, talking to? Yeah, there's visual continuity within a scene is something that's very important. Uh, for 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 passing along information to your audience, and he's completely unconcerned with it. Yeah. Um, so you know, I think he says specifically that that one thing, all he was trying to do with this movie was to make it as entertaining as possible, and yeah, he he did that. Uh, but the lack, the lack of convention not even not even on a plot line but lack of convention down to how you yeah, cinematography things. yeah <clears throat> cinematography and, and and framing and and it's just it's very well that's why i feel so disjointed something. and i totally <laughs> yeah like i said yeah, i totally agree with so the disjointed. studio he made a film that makes <laughs> kind of no sense yeah and i don't know how much money it made but but i think that's about I'm all sure we had to say about this film so yeah, yeah. And I think I think if we keep talking too much, we'll just we'll, go and circle, we'll have so. absolutely nothing. We'll just have absolutely nothing to say about Tokyo Drifter. Yeah. Um, so let's so, let's end it there. I think. Yeah. Uh, thanks for listening to uh, to Lost in Criterion once again. Uh, I am the Adam Glass, always with John Patrick Owatari Dorgan. That's new. What we're doing in <laughs> credits too. I I don't know. I wanted to do it. Okay, thing. I like it. All right. I'm sorry. <laughs> Next week we will be talking about another uh, Suzuki film, uh, one he made previous, prior to this rather, uh, previous to this, I guess I could have said that either way, but anyway, uh, Tokyo Drifter, uh, which came out I think just the year before, uh, 1966, might have been 1965, but anyway, um, it came out at some point. (laughs) Yes, I'm sure it did. (laughs) Of course it did. Anyway, we'll see you next time. No, it came out in 65. Yep, see you next time. Um, thanks for listening. Bye. Bye. to Lost in Criterion, a production of With Two Brains. The show is hosted by Adam Glass and John Patrick Owatari Dorgan. Jonathan Hape did the music, and Adam Glass also edited it all together. Feel free to contact us by email via lostincriterion at withtwobrains.com or join us on the web at www.lostincriterion.com.